So why do we need LLM evaluation? Why is it why is it important? The headliner here is that eval is the gateway to production. It determines whether your models are actually ready or not for production. Hey, is this um, LLM actually providing complete, accurate, and helpful responses? Is it leading to downstream positive user experiences? And critically, is it adhering to company policies, ethical standards, brand guidelines, certain you know com compliance standards? The notion of LLM eval is actually quite nuanced um, in this Gen AI world. And so having a very clear understanding of what good looks like ends up being a critical step to shipping with confidence. Second, you know, having an eval is a great way to understand, hey, as I'm making updates to my LLM, is it performing better? Are there regressions? Think of it as a unit test as a, in a way for whether you're, you're confidently shipping changes to your actual LLM pipeline. And critically, ideally, evals are giving you a sense of where the model's falling down and needs improvement. It can be that compass to help you understand, hey, where do I need to actually improve in order to make sure that this model is actually ready for production? And so when you think about eval in the LLM world, the definition of what good looks like is actually way more nuanced than accuracy on its own. There are different axes from toxicity, hey, is this actually a harmful or inappropriate response, um, not just, you know, correct, uh, is this uh, explainable, right? Can the LLM substantiate or cite its right sources when it's actually providing a response? Um, and is it compliant? You know, is this LLM's response in line with company standards, brand guidelines? Is it is it representing our company in a way that is actually acceptable, you know, from a, from a public lens? Now, the key idea here is that evals should be use case specific, right? They should be enterprise specific. Companies should be taking their own definitions, their own specs for what good looks like and encoding it into their evaluations. And, you know, the sets of acceptance criteria could expand way beyond kind of what standard benchmarks or OSS evals offer. How do you actually build and customize these use case specific, enterprise specific evals so that they work for your own use case? And in a Gen AI world, right, this process, as I alluded to earlier, is more critical than ever, right? There's this notion that the long tail is often the most critical in these Gen AI use cases. You can imagine, hey, let's let's assume we're building some sort of e-commerce chatbot. There are certain queries that users might have about shipping issues, around credit card transactions, where, hey, now they're actually churn risks. Now they're actually, you know, talking about the user experience in a way that is really, really critical to get right. That long tail is often where you want to pay attention to make sure that your LLM is actually operating um, in, a, in a positive way at scale. Two, as I alluded to earlier, the definition of correctness is actually quite nuanced, right? A response can be technically accurate, but be rude, be non-compliant. It could be technically accurate, but it could be missing critical information or context. That definition of correctness is often subjective as well when you're asking annotators to label this. And so being able to handle that nuance, that subjectivity ends up being um, an, an added challenge in this Gen AI first world. Third, these LLMs are being asked to do dozens, hundreds, sometimes thousands of infinite, you know, fine grained tasks. You can think about, you know, traditional machine learning models. They had a very concrete output schema. Hey, is this document, is this email spam or normal? Hey, what is the you know, a, a set of entities that re relate to kind of companies in this document. In the LLM world, a chatbot could be asked to do one or, you know, hundreds of these individual tasks um, and possibly even take actions. And so the action space, the output space of these LLMs are much broader. And as a result, the evals that we build for them actually need to be far more fine grained as well. Leading with the punchline here, right, the spoiler alert is that enterprises are really blocked on effective LLM evaluation for a number of reasons. One, current approaches, which I'll go into in just a second, are often pretty generic, right? They're not built for your specific enterprise data and objectives, and as a result, you know, aren't as effective, right? They're usually evaluating more, more global, you know, generic objectives, which are quite helpful when you're building these base foundation models, but again, can be less relevant when you're trying to ship your own models to production. Two, these metrics and benchmarks are often pretty coarse grained, right? They don't actually indicate where in the data your model is falling down. They don't indicate what business critical subsets you should pay attention to in order for your LLM to ship confidently to production. That coarse grained nature means that you're 
insights are less useful, your your evals are less actionable, and often ends up being a blocker to shipping with confidence. Third, a lot of the eval approaches today are really hard to scale, right? They're either blocked by expensive subject matter experts, right? The doctors, underwriters, financial analysts, right? Folks who actually have the information in their head about what good looks like. They're spending time in Excel, you know, really manually going through these approaches in a way that isn't scalable. And I'll speak to some other approaches as well, where, hey, you might be using another LLM to um, evaluate your, your model. Sometimes these approaches see really high costs, right, in terms of per token um, cost, especially if you're running this through CI on a per commit or, you know, a, a weekly basis, for example. So with that context in mind, let me jump through a few common approaches and some of their trade-offs. At a high level, we'll talk through three different approaches for LLM eval today as we as we um, see them with our customers and our and our users. And we'll talk about some of the trade-offs and um, where they're helpful and where they sometimes fall down. We'll run through OSS benchmarks and metrics. This is the notion that there's some really exciting open benchmarks out there, many of which we're actually contributors of at uh, on the snorkel side. They're very critical to moving the field forward, um, but often are missing some enterprise-specific context. We'll talk about a very common and exciting approach called LLM as a judge, where you use one LLM in a really fast and scalable way, but often, again, is kind of missing your specific domain knowledge and task-specific nuance. And third, we'll, we'll understand how human annotation is often a great way to leverage your own domain knowledge, but as you can imagine, is very resource intensive and uh, can lead to certain biases if you're not careful about how you're setting up those types of evals. So OSS benchmarks and metrics, right? The field is is uh, built on these types of open benchmarks, right? Uh, we're big fans of Helm over at Stanford. We we help contribute to this over in 2022 in an ongoing way um, with our co-founder Chris Ray, and a lot of these benchmarks, right, are are really really exciting ways to measure generic general purpose LLMs, um, compare them to each other, and have been really good ways to understand, hey, are we moving forward with each iteration of these large language models at scale? So these are really good for comparing these general purpose LLMs, these you know larger foundation models. But oftentimes when we talk to our customers and users, they don't quite apply to specialized use cases, right? These general metrics around say reasoning or NLP or you know um, sentence completion or instruction following are again helpful when you're building these base models, but can be a little bit less relevant when you're trying to build a you know medical copilot, right? Or a or, you know financial services chatbot. Um, they don't often operate over proprietary domain specific data, right? They're often built around generalist data sets. And so as a result, can often fall down when you're trying to make them work for your own specific use cases. Another approach that we've seen as a really common and, and actually quite clever approach is to use an LLM as a judge. The idea here is, hey, use one LLM as your evaluator model. You know, this could be an off the shelf GPT. There have been some approaches where you know, uh, folks have been fine tuning their own eval focused LLMs to rate or compare responses. But the challenge here is that while they're really good for quick and dirty sanity checks of, you know, general purpose LLMs, they can be a pretty good way to get, give you a gut check, you know, in a pretty scalable way by just running your LLM, you know, programmatically, they, they can also be very effective for evaluating distilled models, right? So if your main goal is to take some generalist LLM and put it uh, distill it down into a more cost-effective form factor, it can be a very, very effective way to actually you know, use that as a ground truth set. The challenge is that for high accuracy, specialized use cases, again, for cost-effective evaluation where you're sensitive to these high per token costs, these, these methods can, can fall down. And I'll share an analogy for how I think about this, right? Imagine you're a hospital, imagine you've helped train a bunch of college students all the way from undergrad through residency and fellowship, and now you're asking, you know, another college student off the street to evaluate that, you know, doctor who you've trained up over the years. That's often not a sensical way to actually, you know, capture your own objectives and domain specific knowledge, you know, that's specific to your hospital, specific to your specialty, maybe can give a gut check for different types of problems. But if you're really building these enterprise specific applications, this is where we see some of these approaches fall down in, in specialized use cases. Human annotation is another approach here, right? The idea is to take human annotators, either outsourced or in-house, and use them to manually rate or compare LLM responses. And, you know, if you're outsourcing, 
this can be a really you know nice and scalable way for g g domain general problems, but it can really be a non-starter if you're trying to evaluate you know proprietary domain specific data, right? We often work with enterprise customers in finance, healthcare, you know, even tech where data privacy is a huge, huge concern. And even sending a lot of these, you know, data points in, in an outsourced way is, is often a non-starter. These folks don't really have the expertise to label against specific objectives. And in a lot of cases, it's it's just not uh, compliant to send this data off-prem. Another approach is teams may actually leverage their subject matter experts to annotate in-house data, right? And this is great for specialized use cases. It's great to um, you know, try to take a look at these proprietary domain specific data sets. But again, it can be really unscalable. These are, you know, doctors, underwriters, analysts that we're talking about who have day jobs, and we're asking them to spend many, many hours, often hundreds or thousands of hours in Excel, looking at these data points one by one, it can be a really cost ineffective approach that that doesn't quite scale, especially if your objectives are changing a bunch over time, you can imagine, hey, every time you get new data, every time you change your business goals, you kind of have to start from scratch in order to evaluate these models um, in a robust way over time. So on their own, a lot of these approaches are, are insufficient for enterprise use cases. A lot of our focus at Snorkel has been thinking about how do we take these approaches and um, you know, take the best of all of these worlds to, to build these domain-specific custom evals that work for you know, enterprise use cases. So that's really what we're going to be talking about with our own approach here is to say, LM evaluation, what can we do if we power these evals using a lot of our, you know, bread and butter programmatic data development approaches, which I'll go into in a little bit more detail here. So high level idea is, you know, we often recommend to our users and customers to build LLM evals with confidence. You need to be building custom fine grain evals over your specific data and your specific expertise. The benefit here is threefold. One, they're specialized, right? So they're purpose built with, with your own spec, right? To outsource your spec is to outsource your special sauce and your um, differentiation. And so keeping that in-house knowledge of what good looks like is, is uh, and encoding that into your evals is a really critical piece here. Two, these evals have to be fine grained, right? We have to go beyond these coarse grain high level metrics and really help our users understand what does performance look like over business critical data slices, which I'll go into a little bit more detail, but the TLDR is these slices represent subsets of data that are meaningful to you. They could be different tasks. They could be different languages that you care about, different product lines or topics you want to monitor performance over. Again, these are all specific to enterprises. And so encoding that knowledge of what matters to you ends up being a really critical component of getting that fine grained understanding of how this LLM is performing. And three, we should be building these evals in a much more scalable way, right? Instead of operating in Excel or in ad hoc, you know, ways, the emailing documents back and forth, how do we capture this in a programmatic workflow where we're building code artifacts that are scalable, that can be audited just like, you know, software is, that can be adapted and refactored just like software is. How do you build much more scalable artifacts that will scale with your changing business needs and changing data distributions? So on the specialized front, you know, one way to think about this from a mental model perspective is the more complex and bespoke your data is, right? Hey, the more, you know, healthcare specific or hospital specific your data is, the more you'll need this specialized custom eval. The higher your model accuracy as well, the more you'll need these custom evals, right? You can imagine we, we work with some financial services customers who really can't afford certain hallucinations, um, especially when they're powering co-pilots for their analysts, especially when they're powering customer facing workflows, right? Where a mistake about someone's balance or transaction information can often be a major, major security and compliance risk. And so this is an oversimplified view to think about when this specialized you know, purpose-built eval is important. And in a lot of enterprise use cases, we find that some amount of customization is very, very high leverage for these teams. Two, it's really important to measure this fine-grained performance, right? And the key abstraction, as I alluded to earlier, is the notion of a data slice, right? These models are being asked to perform a number of different tasks at the end of the day and being able to track, hey, what is the performance when I'm, you know, when our users are filing a dispute versus checking a balance versus reporting theft or fraud, can be a very, very important way to understand business critical performance. With coarse grain metrics, you might get a high level accuracy metric or a high level blue score or rouge score, 
but it's not really telling you, hey, what are my business critical functions that I need to really shore up before I actually feel comfortable shipping this to production? So again, the key abstraction here is slice and dice your data with data slices and use that to define different meaningful tasks, languages, topics, really whatever is meaningful to your business to actually evaluate um, in production use cases. The last pillar here is all about building scalable evals, right? And this is where a lot of the technology that we've built way back from our early days as a research project at Stanford come into play, right? A lot of the key idea here is you want to take your domain knowledge and expertise, right? We want to have your subject matter experts and data scientists sitting next to each other instead of in silos. Again, these are collaborations with doctors, with underwriters, with analysts, with folks who actually have the knowledge for what good looks like. And we want to encode that into programmatic code artifacts. So one piece of intuition here is, hey, you know, if we have an, a specific catalog, you know, of, of products, let's map that to different slices, right? That's a piece of domain knowledge that we should encode into our software system. Hey, if, you know, points in this cluster are related to, you know, friendly or positive responses, yeah, let's label that as an acceptable response. These are all heuristics or, or a kind of pro programmatic artifacts that we can use to scale out subject matter expertise. Okay, so we've talked about each one of these three axes. How does this actually look in practice? What does the workflow look like to build these custom evals in a scalable and efficient way? So we have a four-step workflow here that Rebecca, again, will go into in a little bit more detail, but I'll help set the stage here and frame what this looks like in practice, right? And the key idea is that we're trying to take the best of all of those approaches that we mentioned earlier with a hybrid programmatic and manual approach to really give your teams the highest leverage when it comes to building purpose-built use case-specific evals for your enterprise problems. So the first step here is to build a golden data set with your own expertise. The idea is that, hey, these experts in your organizations, uh, you want to use their time really effectively. So rather than having them label tens of thousands, you know, possibly millions of data points, let's have them focus on a subset you know, and, and start to write down the rationale for what good looks like in a pretty meaningful way. So let's create that golden data set with your limited budget. And step two is all about encoding and scaling that acceptance criteria into what we call a quality model. The goal of this quality model is to really imitate the preferences and rationale of these experts. And we'll go into a little bit more detail about how we do that from a technical perspective. But this is really a much more scalable way to model your experts using a purpose-built, you know, scalable artifact here. Step three is to really write down, hey, what are the what are the prompts that matter to you, right? What are the slices that we want to really encode in order to understand how, you know, for example, shipping shipping issues compared to general product Q&A questions in your user queries? What are those slices and how do we encode them in a meaningful way? And step four is all about taking all these pieces, pulling them together into a fine-grained benchmark so that you can actually understand what, what is good look like, where is my model falling down, and... What are my next steps for actually improving performance? So let me run through each one of these steps quickly. Step one is all about, you know, taking your gold, uh, your, your experts and, and helping them derive a golden data set. So the key idea here is quite simple. You can imagine, hey, using your experts, let's actually try to write down what sorts of responses are acceptable versus ones that we should reject. As they're doing this, you can imagine they're actually running through a bunch of rationale in the back of their heads, right? They're saying, okay, great. This was pretty concise. This response, it was friendly. You know, it says the right information. I'm going to, I'm going to accept this. In these cases, they might realize, Hey, this is not really answering our users questions. We should be pulling from the website, giving a link and actually providing the answer instead of referring them to their website. That's not, that's not a great response. Let's actually reject this. These pieces of rationale, you know, are, are pieces that we want to encode in our quality model. So the key idea here is all of these pieces of acceptance criteria, we want to programmatically encode into a custom quality model. The intuition for how SMEs are actually judging responses, we can write it down, right? We can capture that into our acceptance criteria. So in this case, we could say, hey, if responses, I don't know, or contains personal information that's definitely not compliant, if it's way too verbose, yeah, I don't, I don't like that response. Let's reject it. In other cases, we might say, if a response is well structured, right? Hey, maybe this is a co-pilot use case where we need a quickly skimmable and glanceable, you know, response so that an agent, a human in the loop agent, can actually leverage this more effectively. Yeah, that's that's a great response. Let's actually accept that if you know it has a positive tone, you know, and represents our you know friendly brand guidelines. Hey, let's accept that as well. Again, these are simplified examples, but the key idea is 
how would your SMEs actually judge responses when they were going through that manual exercise? And how do we scale this process up programmatically to encode that criteria into a custom quality model? So again, what does this look like in practice? Now, not only do we have manual ground truth, we also have programmatic artifacts that represent our SMEs preferences. Hey, if the response redirects to a website, that's not great. We got to reject that. Or if a response is pretty friendly, great. You know, let's accept that response. And taking a number of these heuristics, we can actually start to build a quality model at scale. So I'll glaze over some of the details here, but again, a lot of our bread and butter workflow at Snorkel is all about taking expertise and coding that into these programmatic artifacts, denoising them and combining them so that you have high quality data for the purpose of evaluation. So this is a virtuous cycle, right? It's an iterative cycle where you continuously take SME knowledge and ultimately continue to up-level and, and, and encode that knowledge into artifacts so that you get much more scalable data sets in a quality model at the end of the day. The third step of the workflow here, once you have that quality model, is to actually slice and dice your prompts, right? The goal here is to encode your, you know, semantically meaningful tasks, topics, and languages that you in particular care about for your business. Um, and make sure that you're monitoring performance over those specific slices. So in this case, one slice might correspond to basic business facts. Hey, when is, when is the store open? You know, do you have international shipping? These are basic kind of Q&As about um, maybe an e-commerce business overall. And you can group in one way to say, hey, this is maybe a slice that um, we get a lot of questions about. It's very high volume. It sits in that head or torso distribution, but is, is important for us to get right so that users are coming to our store at the right hours. On the other hand, there might be a slice of requests that we're getting related to shipping issues, for example. This may be a little bit rarer than business facts, but are really important for us to get right because, hey, if you know someone's package arrived, but you know, or, or if tracking says it arrived, but it didn't actually, or someone wants to return an item and you know they're, they're having issues, um, these are possible churn risks, right, for our users, or may actually affect the overall customer experience. So while you know these slices represent different subsets or you know different proportions of the data set it may often be the same case that a rarer you know infrequent slice could be really meaningful to the business to get right so bringing all these pieces together we can actually now produce an eval report that gives us that fine-grained report right so unpacking this a little bit the rows of our report correspond to different data slices. Hey, business Q&A versus shipping issues. We now have a much more fine-grained view in addition to overall quality view of what this looks like. And the columns here correspond to different metrics, right? We can evaluate against our manual ground truth. We can evaluate against, against our quality mod model, which was much more programmatic, and any other sorts of metrics that we might want to encode into our benchmark. Now we have a really fine-grained kind of detailed view to help us understand where our model is falling down and what to do next. So you might realize, oh shoot, you know, shipping issues are actually a major uh, important you know, customer success metric that we want to improve. Um, let's dig a little deeper and let's try to you know, improve quality here, for example. Once you actually improve quality, you might want to do some sort of pairwise comparison. Hey, maybe I started with a Llama 70B model. I fine-tuned it you know, using some great uh, uh, data development techniques to curate data. And okay, great. You know, I'm starting to improve performance over that slice in a meaningful way, right? Using these types of fine-grained benchmarks as a way to effectively unit test your data and your LLMs and avoid regressions is a very practical way that we found teams can start building confidence over their specific custom, you know, uh, use cases and evaluations. So let me zoom out for a second, right? What did I just show? I showed how you can take expertise and use their time more effectively to create that golden data set. We talked about how to encode that expert acceptance criteria into a custom quality model using a lot of these programmatic data development techniques. We talked about how to slice and dice the different prompts of your you know, query space so that users actually get a sense of, hey, what matters to me and what do we want to track? And we talked about how to pull all these pieces together so that you have now a fine-grained benchmark that you can action on and understand quality with um, to, again, ship your LLMs with confidence.